Is consciousness fundamental or emergent? This is a hard question, but there are some strong reasons to suppose that some answers are much more plausible than others. So let's take a look at the reasons. In physics, there's a list of fundamental particles called the standard model. Everything not in the standard model is said to be emergent. For example, when you use gluons to bind two up quarks and one down quark, a proton emerges. If you combine eight protons with eight electrons, an oxygen atom emerges. Bond that with two hydrogen atoms, and a water molecule emerges. Now a chair emerges at a much higher level. If you take a small piece of a chair, it would be very difficult to tell whether that piece came from a chair or from something else. Stuff doesn't really emerge as a chair until it provides some place to sit. So chairs are definitely far from the fundamental end of the spectrum. But where exactly does consciousness fall? Is there a missing particle in the standard model that grants things the property of being conscious? One oft-cited piece of evidence that consciousness may be fundamental comes from the von Neumann-Wigner interpretation of quantum mechanics. It suggests conscious observation is what causes the wave functions to collapse in quantum mechanics, and this behavior has been demonstrated in numerous quantum physics experiments. There are two reasons why this argument does not really indicate that consciousness is fundamental. First, the von Neumann-Wigner interpretation is only one interpretation of quantum mechanics. Other interpretations, such as many worlds, don't even have a concept of wave function collapse in them, and yet they still explain everything that we've been able to observe. So the argument becomes rather circular. The people who promote the von Neumann-Wigner interpretation are usually the same people who want consciousness to be fundamental, and surprise, it tells them that it is. Second, even if the von Neumann-Wigner interpretation turns out to be the correct interpretation of quantum mechanics, it uses a very different notion about what consciousness actually is. The Oxford Dictionary defines consciousness as the state of being awake and aware. When you have surgery, for example, your anesthesiologist is not usually very concerned that you might be collapsing quantum wave functions while you're on the operating table. He or she most likely just doesn't want you to be awake and aware of all the pain. So overlapping terminology has just caused a lot of unnecessary confusion here. Even the von Neumann-Wigner interpretation does not imply that some missing particle in the standard model is responsible for your being awake and aware. Another argument for fundamental consciousness comes from the philosopher René Descartes. He set out to doubt everything that could be doubted. Well, he concluded that our conscious experiences are the only things we really know for sure. If we throw out everything we don't know for sure, then we must conclude that all of physics, all the way down to the standard model of fundamental particles, is a creation of our conscious minds. But one of many problems with this reasoning is that the physical realm still enables us to interact with each other. For example, it would be pretty messed up if I were to suddenly just punch you in the face. But you know what's even more messed up than that? Why did you choose at that very same moment to have the corresponding experience of being punched in the face? Perhaps the whole universe is being imagined by a single supermind with the incredible ability to keep all of its stories straight while contemplating every fundamental particle in the universe. But if you think about it, that would really be indistinguishable from the physical universe just being real. So why do we actually need to suppose there's a supermind out there in the first place? Wouldn't it be just a whole lot simpler to suppose the physical world is real? Descartes' approach of discarding everything we don't actually know for sure inevitably leads to Cartesian dualism. This suggests that the mind is the product of something other than the body. We call it the dual. Dualism implies that the brain is really just some kind of control paddle that the dual actually uses to operate our bodies. Notably, this idea is surprisingly consistent with the spirits or ghosts hypothesized by many popular religions. But this would also imply that every brain is actually an interface to the supernatural or spiritual realm. If this were the case, there must needs be a significant flow of information between the body and the dual, or else it wouldn't really be the dual directing our conscious experiences. Yet, when neuroscientists scrutinize any region of brain tissue, they find it behaves in a consistent manner, meaning there's not much room for a lot of information to be flowing in from a supernatural realm. It turns out that rejecting everything we don't know for sure is not exactly a recipe for obtaining a clear picture of how things really are. For example, I don't even know for sure that the Earth is round. I mean, I've seen pictures from space, but maybe NASA just faked those. And I've used Google Earth, but maybe Google is in on the conspiracy. Of course, I have confirmed that many places on Earth are consistent with Google Maps, but I haven't been everywhere. 
I did construct a sundial once, and its behavior was consistent with my latitude, but maybe that was just a coincidence. And I have seen the shadow of the Earth on the moon during a lunar eclipse, but maybe my retinas are lying to me too? And I've seen that the sun and the moon are round, but maybe the Earth is some kind of celestial exception. I understand how gravity pulls matter into a sphere, but maybe my whole education was calculated to mislead me. I've tested the Coriolis effect, I've seen that the Foucault pendulums rotate every 24 hours. At some point, we've got to admit that throwing out everything we don't know for sure, like Descartes did, is not a path to great understanding. Flat Earthers use their intuition that the Earth seems flat to deny empiricism. Evolution denialists use their intuition that complex things seem to have been created to deny empiricism. And dualists use their intuition that our conscious experiences seem to require more than physics to deny empiricism. They're all trying to be skeptical. They're all trying to avoid being deceived. But they're all throwing out the most effective method we have for determining what is real. Empiricism. Of course, if we really embrace empiricism, we must be willing to refine our positions when more evidence is found. If enough evidence were found, the dualists could turn out to be right. If enough evidence were found, the evolution denialists could turn out to be right. Heck, if enough evidence were found, it could turn out that the Earth is somehow actually flat. But we must recognize that intuition is guided by cognitive biases. The whole point of empiricism is to try to see through those biases. So let's not pretend intuition is some kind of valid reason for throwing out empiricism. Why are people so determined to conclude that consciousness comes from somewhere other than the brain? One reason might be because the brain just processes information. They don't like the idea that processing information is sufficient to explain consciousness. But if there was a dual responsible for consciousness, it would have to work somehow. And whatever it does, couldn't we just simulate that with an information processing machine? The Church-Turing thesis suggests that we could. And whatever information this dual supposedly sends back to the brain could be calculated without using the dual. And that means that an information processing machine must be sufficient to explain consciousness. The so-called hard problem of consciousness is created by people who are determined that any explanation for consciousness must involve some component that cannot be understood. And they're not completely wrong. You see, persuading people to let go of that silly notion really is hard. One thing we know empirically is that chemical drugs in the brain alter consciousness. This is so consistent that anesthesiologists have refined the process to the point that we can use it for surgery and not kill our patients on the operating table. Another thing we know empirically is that the flow of information within the brain can be traced. This is so consistent that neuroscientists have mapped the specific cognitive functions of several lobes in the brain, and they even understand how some of those lobes actually work. The simplest explanation I can find that is consistent with these two empirical observations is that consciousness emerges in the brain.